The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one can do these (laughs) signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, my question for you this morning is, what is something that someone has told you that is truly a challenge to believe or understand? As I was thinking about this morning's sermon, I looked up a list of unbelievable facts, and I brought some of them with me to share this morning. Of course, being an animal lover, a lot of them are about animals. But um, Did you know that there is a, a dog who served four terms of mayor? in the city of Cormorant, Minnesota. Duke the Big Shaggy Great Pyrenees was first elected in 2014 and continued to win yearly elections until announcing his retirement in 2018. Duke plans to write a book about his legacy of being a very good boy. I don't know about the second part. I don't think that's true. Um, Did you know that a shot of espresso contains less caffeine than a cup of coffee? It's not much less, but it is less. (laughs) And here's another one that, you know, I I didn't think it was that hard to believe, but apparently animal experts say say this is really hard to believe. Um, There was a kangaroo that saved the life of a man who rescued her. Her name is Lulu. And Lulu was rescued. Her mother had been hit by a car, and he rescued her and brought her to his home, and they raised her as a pet. And one day in 2003... The man who rescued her was knocked unconscious by a falling branch on his property, and Lulu stayed beside him and yapped very loudly until the family could find him. And uh, Lynn survived his injuries, um, and, but animal experts remarked that it is not likely for a kangaroo to be loyal. So that was kind of amazing. This one, more difficult to believe, it's about a cat. Did you know that the CIA once tried to create cat spies. <laughs> Not kidding. The project was called Acoustic Kitty, which is a great name for a band, don't you think? <laughs> Acoustic Kitty, and they attempted, attempted to implant listening devices into the ears of cats in hopes of eavesdropping on top-secret con- conversations. Apparently it didn't work, because <laughs> the cats probably didn't listen to them. <laughs> Boston was nearly destroyed by a flood of molasses. I'm not going to get into that one because it's actually a sad story. It it really is. Actually, people died. It's incredible. It's a crazy story. 
Um, the heaviest pumpkin weighed more than a ton. And finally, my second favorite of the bunch. Did you know that Apollo 11 astronauts had to go through customs after returning from the moon? <laughs> they, they declared moon rocks and moon dust and other lunar samples on their customs form. True story. Oh, it's fun to learn crazy facts, right, and to think about un things that are unbelievable. Um, some of them are almost so crazy that we believe them because who could make something like that up? Some of them are slightly believable. Um, or maybe you can even imagine, uh, maybe you could imagine them even though they are unusual. Today's gospel details a few unbelievable facts that Jesus shares with Nicodemus. For Nicodemus, and likely most of us too, when we're really reflective about it, these facts that Jesus shares would have been even more unbelievable than any of the fun facts I listed today. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, and incidentally, this particular scene of Jesus meeting Nicodemus in the night is a fabulous scene in the series The Chosen that our Bible study group is watching right now. So if you haven't joined that group, please do. It's a great series, and this is one of my favorite scenes um, when Nicodemus has been hearing and observing the things that are going on in Jerusalem and all over the countryside. But unlike many of the other Pharisees, Nicodemus is curious, and he's amazed at these things that Jesus is doing. And so he wants to come and find out more about this. He's not threatened by Jesus as many of the other Pharisees are. So, perhaps to avoid losing his standing, Nicodemus sneaks out in the night to meet Jesus, to ask his burning questions, and learn more about this Jesus that everyone is talking about who can perform miracles and signs. Jesus, in this passage, essentially lays out for Nicodemus and for all believers exactly what he has come for, which is to save people so that they may be born again from water and the Spirit. This is our baptism Jesus is talking about. We are born again from God through Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's funny how Nicodemus responds at first. How can I be born again if I've already been born from my mother's womb? But it's really a great question, right? I'm sure I would have asked the exact same thing at that time. Because, of course, no one had ever been sp spoken of being born again. And it would have been hard to understand what he meant by that. Of course, now we understand in hindsight what he meant. It wasn't a literal being born into the flesh, but it was being born into the spirit for eternal life with God. But nonetheless, this was an unbelievable fact that clearly wouldn't have been easy to accept. And then, as Nicodemus is still pondering and wondering in complete confusion, it really is one of my favorite scenes in The Chosen. It's just done so brilliantly. But Jesus goes on to share two more unbelievable facts. The first, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 is the most uh, quoted Bible, Bible passage or Bible verse of scripture. In fact, when you pull it up on a Google search, it's number one on pretty much all of them. And I think that's fascinating because it's one of the most unbelievable facts to be shared with someone, especially Nicodemus this night, is now the most widely used to describe the Christian faith in one sentence. Unbelievable fact number two. Does anyone know John 3.17 without looking? Anyone? Anyone? Right. I wonder why it's not attached to John 3.16. Why is it not attached? Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We don't memorize that one. But to me, it's just as important as the first. And it's detachment, I think, sadly, often causes us to use John 3.16 in a way to uh, wonder about who's in and who's out, or who's a believer and who's not, who's getting saved, who isn't. So that also causes me to wonder which of these two facts is harder to believe today. 
that God would send God's son to die for us or that God didn't do this to condemn the world, but to save the world, everyone. What would it look like if we didn't quote John 3.16 at all, but we shared John 3.17? Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In a very Lutheran, snobby way, I admit, I kind of think the world would all look a little more like Lutherans. (laughs) But, But seriously, God sent the Son not to condemn, but to save. If we use this verse, would we quit bickering about which laws are right, which laws still pertain today, which laws are literal and which aren't? Would we constantly be wondering who believes or who doesn't? Or would we be so excited about this news that we would share it with anyone we came into contact with because it's such good news for everyone. It might change their lives. Jesus came for them, for everyone, not to condemn them. Please don't get me wrong. I love John 3.16. It's a very important statement of faith for us. But I guess what I'm saying is let's not overlook 3.17 so much either. In fact, Jesus' use of the word indeed at the beginning of this seems to indicate that both of these sentences mean pretty much the same thing. Both seem unbelievable. Although one has been fulfilled through Jesus' death and resurrection. Perhaps the second one is harder for us to take because it means the good news is for all people, even the ones I don't think it should be for. Wouldn't it be great if, if I could just see the world as God does, totally redeemable because of Christ? For God so loved the world that he sent his only son not to condemn, but to save the world. There's such unbelievable statements when we really reflect on them, and yet so very believable too. In fact, so believable that at the end of John's gospel, Nicodemus, this Pharisee, a part of a group of people who were responsible for Jesus' death, he comes out of the shadow of night into the daylight and brings a hundred pounds worth of proper spices, myrrh and aloes, and helps Joseph of Arimathea wrap Jesus' body. Perhaps Nicodemus realized finally what Jesus meant about rebirth, that even he was redeemable and worthy of God's love. Perhaps we, with the help of John 3:16 and 17, can also come to understand these most unbelievable facts as well, that God's love is so strong, it's almost unbelievable. And even more unbelievable is that it is for every single one of us. Amen.